and uh, I'm a dementia lead nurse uh, down in Sussex, uh, working in the community trust now, but for three years I was lead nurse for dementia care at the Royal Sussex in Brighton. Um, Royal Sussex has um, checkered history, but uh, I can tell you it was an incredible place to work. Um, I started my uh, nursing career in dementia in uh, mental health, um, working on um, assessment wards. Um, started in the very late 90s when dementia care in wards was everybody up at 7, pills at 8, breakfast at 9, toilet at 10, tea at 2, bed at 6. That was it. And that was okay. Everybody thought that was alright. Nobody challenged the status quo. And uh, 22 year old at me wanted to start a revolution and um, I'm, I'm still, still going. So there we are. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, dementia care in hospital, really in terms of what good looks like. I'm sorry, I'm quite nervous. If I trip over my words, do excuse me. Um, I can only tell you what I think good looks like. There's all sorts of initiatives, evidence bases, all kinds of things, all kinds of ideas about what hospital care should be. There's a huge national agenda around dementia-friendly hospi hospitals. Some of us don't like the term dementia-friendly, some of us prefer the term dementia-supportive. You know, so there's all kinds of different views around what good looks like. So, what does it look like? Well, of course, if you're going to have um, you know, good care in hospitals, and there's been huge amounts of initiatives to try and embed good practice around dementia care. Um, and one of the things now, again, I know we don't like the use of the word suffering, do we? But I can tell you, in the NHS, we suffer terribly from initiative items. We <laughs> <laughs> really, really do. That's a really good idea. And then six months later, everyone's forgotten about it. So if we want to have good dementia care in hospital, it's got to be compassionate, hasn't it? And for staff to feel compassion for that person with dementia in the bed that they're looking after. They have to be confident in their own abilities to look after that person as a starting point. And one of the things that ward staff always tell me is they don't feel confident in looking after people with dementia. Hospitals have to be organised. Well, let me tell you, a few months ago, a lady with dementia said to me, the trouble with you lot is the left arm don't know what the right arm's doing. <laughs> very, very true. Um, can to be well informed don't know who you're looking after, then you have no hope of really giving them the right care. Um, some, some of you may know from my Twitter feed, my lovely gran, she lived with dementia and uh, she had a lifelong loathing of loud noises because she'd had you know, anxiety since being a small girl. And one of the things that happened to her in hospital was she was in a bay where there was a bin at the end and it wasn't one of those soft clothes ones. So every time a nurse came in, tipped off the glass, bang, like that, and, like, Ooh, like that. and then they'd be like, oh, Pat, be quiet. No. But actually, she didn't like the loud noise. And actually, people had bothered to read that on her information. And one afternoon, I'd had enough of this, so I picked up the bin and moved it. You would not believe the trouble I got in the bin, honestly. So there we are. Um, <laughs> Care has to be person centered. <coughs> every hospital, every care home, every institution, and I, I do use the word institution because that's what they are, um, says they're person centered. Are they really? Probably not. But it's in every mission statement, it's in every vision of care, it's in every philosophy of care. But actually, we do need to be person centered if we're going to give good care in the hospital setting. And staff need to be knowledgeable. When I did my training, um, much maligned Project 2000, Personally, I thought it was all right, because you know, I'd like to think that I'm not a bad nurse, maybe. I mean, I'll reserve judgment, let others pass. Um, I had about 30 minutes of dementia training in my pre-registration education. This is dementia, it's kind of brain fail. It's all you need to know. Not helpful. And still, I think, in terms of education for health professionals and non-specialists, it's kind of woefully lacking. Mm -hmm. So, what do staff say? make all of these things so difficult to deliver. I haven't got time. I haven't got time. I haven't got time. Dare I be controversial and say that if nurses spent less time saying they haven't got time, they might make themselves a little bit of time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but, but it is an issue. You know, what can you really do in five minutes with somebody? How can you change the quality of your interaction because you can't necessarily change the quantity of your interaction.
emotion. He's just aggressive. It doesn't matter what we do. He's just aggressive. So aggressive. It's a label that sticks like glue. Mm -hmm. And once somebody's been labeled as aggressive, they are smart. And actually, it's easy as somebody who is, I'm not an expert in dementia, I don't live with dementia, but I know a thing or two about nursing people with dementia. But that doesn't mean that the people that I'm leading know so much about looking after that person with dementia. So I could pour scorn on that nurse who says, well, he's just aggressive. But actually one of the things I do need to do is take a step back and recognise that that is a valid concern. Because actually, if someone's calling you a fucking bastard for the 28th time that year, that's quite hard. You know, and people with dementia sometimes do say things to you that can hurt. Uh, a lady that I looked after a couple of years back, she <coughs> once looked at me and said, you've got such a pretty face. And I was thinking, oh. And then she went, but it's a shame you're so fat. <laughs> <laughs> she had a point. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, people say, we aren't dementia specialists. This isn't the right place for them. I hear that every single day. We should have dementia specialist wards. You know, um, well, people don't go to hospital because of their dementia. They go because they have unstable diabetes. They go because they've got a broken bone. They go because they've got five or six other things wrong with them. So yes, it is your responsibility to look after them well. But equally, recognising these things and then thinking, how can we help staff feel more empowered to give better care? That's one of the answers to this conundrum. I don't really think the press give hospitals a fair crack of the <laughs> And this is our favourite newspaper. And in fact, the Daily Mail love this headline so much, they use it again and again and again. <laughs> um, so it's really difficult to kind of work in the NHS with this kind of national media backdrop of actually outright hostility in a lot of cases. And of course, it's really good to know that the NHS is in a safe pair of hands. <laughs> now, <laughs> a few months ago, uh, no, sorry, a, a couple of years ago now, because it was when I was still at the Royal Sussex, Mr Hunt came for a visit. I asked if I could meet him, I was told no. I think somebody might have looked at my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things that do help, though. Now, leadership, that's so, so important <laughs> in a hospital setting. And, you know, having been in a lead nurse role for a few years now, I really see the importance of this. But you can't do it all on your own. And I think the mistake trusts have made to parachute in one kind of lead nurse, one nurse consultant, and that's down to you to educate, to inform, to inform the strategy, to be the leader, the teacher, the politician, once you start having to go to the board meetings, you know, and satisfy the operational agenda as well as the strategic agenda. But actually it's about being able to lead the care that people get. And sometimes your focus is diverted away from that when your remit is so big. But we do need good leadership the courage to do things differently. It's quite hard in ward settings where you've perhaps got a team, we've been together for a long time, we've always done it this way, so we don't want to do it differently. And that might just mean, for example, a laughable situation the other week on a ward, um, hot dinner at lunchtime. This gentleman says, I want the sandwich. Housekeeper says, but it's your hot dinner at lunchtime, we have a sandwich for tea. And he's going, but I want a sandwich. And this Ward housekeeper just could not get his head around the fact that it, it doesn't bloody matter whether it's lunch time or tea time, you know. But those little cultural things make such a huge difference. And equally, you know, on a more serious level, you still hear, if you spend time on a ward, I guarantee you will hear people saying, the patient says, nurse, I want to go to the toilet. And somebody says, well, you've got a pad on, it's all right. Mm -hmm. No, it's not all right. And actually, but having the courage to challenge that practice. If I'm a healthcare assistant, and um, maybe I'm quite a new healthcare assistant, and a senior healthcare assistant who I'm working with, who's quite a powerful figure in that ward dynamic, says, well, no, that's what we do. Am I going to have the guts and the courage to challenge that? And what do, is my ward manager going to look after me if I do challenge that? And actually, we, we, we have to enable people to be courageous because otherwise nothing will change. Um, the right culture is so easy to say, isn't it? But less easy to put in place, and cultures are complex. And sometimes you have to step back and think, what are the little things that I can 
change. And from that, you can then do more and more. But to recognise our limitations, um, th th there's so much expertise in person-centred thinking and there's so much literature on kind of relationship-centred care. But actually, if you're asking somebody who's had very little training, maybe they've only been in the healthcare setting for a very short period of time and you're asking them to form a relationship with that person, we can't suddenly expect them to be experts in Kitwood's model of dementia or the five key elements of well-being. Yeah, we just can't do that. So we have to think, how can we help people understand what they need to do? Um, and as I think has been a theme throughout this afternoon, as, as Reinhardt was saying, there does need to be access to expertise. There is a place for dementia nurse specialists. There is a place for psychologists. There is a place for dementia specialist practitioners. But the commissioning around that is weak. Um, this is um, a medical ward. Um, it's the Emerald Unit at Royal Sussex in Brighton. And um, really, I'm just, there's, there's so much noise around dementia environments, and it is about more than just the aesthetics. Mm. But what this room became was a hub, really, for staff to sit with people who were being cared for, visitors to sit, a place away from the bedside. You don't have to have traditional kind of medical ward environments in general hospitals. They, they can make spaces. Okay. Butterfly scheme, if you're not familiar with it, I would urge you to go and, and look at the website. This is a way of teaching staff a very simple five-step approach to supporting a person with dementia or memory impairment through the use of butterfly symbol, which acts as a request for that care response. And it teaches staff how to involve family carers. So, so important. Um, we've heard a lot about personalised, informed care. So, you've all seen things like the Alzheimer's Society, this is me, the butterfly scheme, reach out to me sheet. Um, it's not just a nice thing, it's a really important intervention actually, it needs to be seen as such. So it gives people a sense of who it is they're looking after. You know, I never knew she was a pub landlady, it makes her seem like the lady she was. Is, not was, you know. And this lovely man mm. I met the other week, he said, God bless the National Health, sometimes they just forget why Frida is a person, because all they see is the illness. And personalised information helps us see beyond that. Uh, this um, was a, a card a family carer made uh, as a thank you for using the butterfly scheme. You know, this is what it can mean to people when you take that bit of extra time. It's not about the big things. Um, <laughs> music. Uh, some of you know I've got a bit of a thing about music. I know it can do really good stuff for people with dementia. It's not for everybody. <coughs> but actually, if you bring these kinds of interventions into ward settings and they're personalised and they're offered to people who want it, not just kind of the Elvis impersonator in the corner singing <laughs> bloody awful songs at home. You know, this is kind of personalised. It's for those who want it and not for those who don't. And it's not just music, it's these kinds of non-medical interventions that need to infiltrate more and more and more into hospital environments that will start to make a difference. And of course the team approach makes all the difference. You know, having a flattened hierarchy, the consultant is not any more important than the um, ward nurse or the ward housekeeper or the ward HCA. Everybody has a value, everybody has a role. And education can't just be about the theory, it has to be about helping people feel what might be happening for somebody. It has to be about recognising what it is you can do to help that person that you're looking after. And the message across the hospital has, and I don't want to gender stereotype at all, that's quite hard to find, <laughs> can't eat. but you know, from Sarah who cleans the ward <coughs> to Bob the CEO, um, I don't know any chief executives that go to work wearing a cape, but you know, <laughs> so, when you Google chief executive, that's one of the things that comes up. Who <laughs> 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 so, um, We do need expert interventions, there does need to be more robust commissioning, there absolutely does, but we can have quick wins that cost nothing. Smile, hello my name is, so important. A shower when I want it, being able to see where the toilet is, having open visiting, we all familiar with John's campaign. Let's stop being frightened of inviting family carers in, let's make them full and equal partners, 
makes life so much easier. And actually, sometimes, you know, I used to get bleeped quite a lot when I was at Brighton. Oh, you know, somebody's kicking off, they're doing this, they're doing that, and Fred's throwing his um, dinner out the window again. You don't see the amount of sandwiches that go flying out the barrier building <laughs> window at some But actually, everybody's going, oh, Fred, stop that, stop that, stop that. Nobody's actually said to him, I'm sorry, I'm so upset. How can I help? And that's often a really important way in. And a bin that shuts quite <laughs> really would be helpful. Um, this is just an example of some of the things, some of, one of the ways in which I teach ward staff yep, okay. um, to try to understand the things they need to do. And this will all make sense to you. And I've chosen to make an acronym CALM because it's kind of antidote to all of the craziness that kind of goes on around. And just get staff to really pause and think about these things. And I'll just leave you with this quote from a, a lady with dementia who um, I came into contact with once and um, there was all this noise around the risk that she got at home. She didn't want people to make a fuss about the risk. She just wanted to get on with the business of living. And that is what hospitals need to help people do. Thank you. <laughs>